Petra means rock, and it's the name the Greeks and Romans gave to this extraordinary city, which we see here in Reconstruction, taking us back 2,000 years to the time of the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans called this city Rakmu, which has quite a different meaning. Rakmu stands for place of color, the colors created by the characteristic stone that still shapes Petra's landscape today. Petra is a unique place in the world, where the Nabataeans and involved workers literally carved into the mountain rocks to build incredible structures and monumental tombs, such as the Pharaoh's treasury, the so-called Petra treasury, or other sumptuous structures, like Eldale or the palace tomb. Petra was a cosmopolitan and very wealthy city, which experienced its heyday in the 1st century AD, but continued to thrive even during the period of Roman rule, becoming a place rich in traditions, styles, cultures, and architectures that managed to merge, creating an extraordinary place, and many consider it the most beautiful archaeological site in the world. Petra had many rulers, the most important being Aretas IV, who ruled until 40 AD. Aretas went down in history as the one who loved his people, while the last ruler was Rabel II who reigned until 106 CE. The year after which the city came under Roman rule. We must immediately say that the Hellenistic imprint of the city is perhaps the most obvious artistic influence. In fact, it's possible to see the work of Hellenistic craftsmen in the city's main monuments, where we often find Corinthian capitals, but also the typical capitals of the Nabataeans, such as those found in the colonnaded street, which show more stylized features and rigid lines. The Nabataeans exploited the rock walls to create masterpieces such as the Temple of Alcasneh, the treasury of Petra, the tomb of the legendary pharaoh who, according to legend, was endowed with extraordinary magical powers and had a tomb built here to guard his treasures. The treasury of Petra was created by carving the rock face from top to bottom, and the stone extracted during the work phases was prepared into blocks and reused for creating other works. Beneath the great treasury are three burial chambers, a splendid treasure enriched with Hellenistic sculptures such as the goddess Nike, Castor, and Pollux. Alcazneh is still located at a higher elevation than where the town proper was located, away from the inhabited center. Continuing towards the valley, we would find a large theater with a grand stage also carved in stone. The theater could hold up to 10,000 spectators, and the seats were entirely carved out of the rock, and were basic, without armrests and backrests. The stage was truly impressive, colossal, and in the Hellenistic style. As we descended towards the city, we would find the first dwellings of this great caravan emporium, and turning our gaze toward the cliff face, we would find the colossal, impressive, and imposing royal tomb complex of the Nabataeans, in which the monumental tombs of the rulers resembled the dwellings and sumptuous palaces of kings. Perhaps the most impressive of these burials is the palace tomb, a monumental complex divided into three floors, characterized by the presence of four portals supported by pillars and columns in perfect Nabataean style. The palace tomb is a great structure because its modular appearance in which the marked subdivision of sections is clearly evident, testifying to the excellent skill of the Nabataean craftsmen.
more than any other place underscoring the cosmopolitan nature of Petra is probably the colonnaded street, a place where we can easily imagine people walking from the three continents of the then known world, from the peoples bordering the Mediterranean, an imposing thoroughfare characterized by the presence of Nabataean columns and two long parallel porticos, at the end of which we would find three arches, two of which are flanked by pillars and arches decorated with Nabataean paintings that preceded a total of no less than 120 columns, 60 on each side. The colonnaded street was Petra's main thoroughfare, a meeting place for merchants, nobles, and citizens of the ancient metropolis. Nearby our large city gardens, there was a great pool, with a cubic structure in the center. Among other imposing structures in Petra, we would have seen the Great Temple, the largest sacred building in the city, a construction also built in the Greco-Roman style preceded by two large porticos and a roofless forecourt, from which one could access the interior of the temple. To access the temple, the Nabataeans had to climb up an imposing staircase and cross the two overlapping terraces that followed the irregularity of the ground, over which the structure was built. Although it's called the Great Temple, there's still debate about the actual nature of the structure, as inside, excavations have revealed the presence of circular stands reminiscent of those of a theatre built during the period of Petra's last rulers before the Roman conquest in the 2nd century AD by Trajan. Undoubtedly, the structure had a religious function, and to confirm this fact, the presence of an altar with a sculptural relief made from the fragments of the findings of the relief of the god Dushara, the supreme god of all Nabataean gods, also known as the Lord of the Mountain, has been suggested. Not far from the Great Temple, there was another important structure influenced by Greco-Roman craftsmen, Casa Albint, a temple built at the foot of Alhabis mountain and consecrated to Dushara and his wife Alusa. The temple resembles a large cube, which one entered by climbing an imposing marble staircase. Looking up at the facade, one would see two decorated pillars on either side, and further out, a large enclosure that ran along the entire perimeter not used for access. For columns, along with the pillars, supported the entablature, adorned with a fine Doric frieze. Inside, vibrant and colorful decorations adorned the sides of the large doorway. Petra's other important iconic structure, which along with the treasury is firmly rooted in the collective imagination, was also located outside the city, on the opposite side from the treasury. This is Ad Deir, also known as the Monastery of Petra, a building also carved from rock. It features a blend of Hellenistic motifs and Nabataean pillar columns, a perfect fusion of styles. It was a very important place of worship, a temple of colossal size that was later converted into a church during the Eastern Roman Empire. Today, Adair has a wind-eroded facade, yet it has not lost its grandeur and splendor. The temple is topped by a 9-meter high urn, and niches that most likely housed statues, as in the treasury, are still visible today. Among the city's most important structures, we should also mention the Temple of the Winged Lions, which has been the subject of lively studies, especially recently. These have led to hypotheses about the structure's possible appearance, two columns decorated, probably with winged lions and acanthus leaves, and two pillars that strengthened the structure. In this building, the stele of the goddess Heiyang was discovered, containing Nabataean inscriptions.
the Nabataean language was a variant of Aramaic. Along the other roads leading to Petra's urban center, we would have found other rock-cut tombs that likely shared similarities with the city's civic structures. In fact, the entire area surrounding the town is characterized by the presence of rock tombs, many of which are smaller than those in the royal tomb's facade, but equally impressive, as well as altars carved into the rock. Despite the Roman conquest in 106 AD, Petra continued to be a thriving, splendid and prosperous city, and even today its remains testify to this splendor, the magnificence of the archaeological site, which many consider the most beautiful and spectacular in the world.